journalist and edited podcast and worked as an urban newspaper reporter. Laddie is the author of In Conflict, Iraq War Veterans Speak Out on Duty, Loss, and the Fight to Stay Alive. And the critically acclaimed We Were There, Voices of African American Veterans from World War II to the War in Iraq. In Conflict was turned into a theater piece that premiered at Temple University in October of 2007. It received raved reviews at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and was awarded the Fringe First Award. In Conflict played off-Broadway at the Barrow Street Theater. In Conflict was also at the heart of a Wilton, Connecticut high school play that after being banned by the school principal became an international story and was then performed in several off-Broadway theaters, including the Public Theater. Both plays were published by Play Scripts. Born and raised in New York City, she earned a BFA in film and television and later an MA in journalism from New York University. Laddie is a DART Fellow from journal for Journalism and Trauma and a Lee Way Foundation Fellow. She is a lifetime member of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and a member of the National Association of Black Journalists. Her work has appeared in USA Today, the Chicago Sun-Times, BET.com, the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, and numerous other media outlets. She has been featured in over 100 media outlets, including Newsweek, CNN, The New York Times, CNN International, Fox News, NPR, The Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Detroit Free Press. And we here at the Legacy Project are very happy to welcome Yvonne Laddie. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really exciting for me to be here. Exciting for me to revisit these veterans and their stories that literally changed my life, changed the trajectory of my life, taught me so much about who I am and where I came from and the legacy of people who look like me, who often are ignored in history. I got the idea to do We Were There while I was working as a reporter for the Philadelphia Daily News. 9-11 happened and um, my job during 9-11 was to call, we got a list from the AP wire service of all the people locally in Philadelphia and the suburbs who, who died. And my editor handed me the list and said, call, call these people's families and get quotes. And so I remember calling them and people were crying. They told me I was a liar. It was just one of the most awful experiences I ever had as a journalist. And afterwards, I mean, I was depressed. I mean, I'm from New York. I have family in New York. I, I felt so connected to what happened, but at the same time, I felt really disconnected from being an American. And that seemed to be what was giving people peace was this idea of like, you know, we're Americans and we stand together behind the flag. But when I would think of being American, I would always hyphenate myself because my parents are immigrants. I would always feel like I was a bit of a second class citizen, even though I was a college graduate and was doing okay. You know, I grew up in the inner city and I had firsthand experience with racism and I just never ever felt like that connection to America or being American. And so I was really wrestling with, with, with all of this and I was sitting at my desk at work and I randomly got a call from a Vietnam veteran who said, who asked me to do an obit on a World War II veteran who worked on this submarine during the war um, and was basically back then the only thing a black person could be was in the Navy was a steward, which was essentially like a waiter. Um, and he would wait on the officers with a little white jacket, but submarines are really small. And so whenever they had an, you know, got attacked, he had to know how to man any single station that he was next to when it happened. And so eventually this man, George Ingram, wound up saving like someone's life. Like he was very active. The, the, the submarine was constantly getting attacked. So he was really quite skilled at using all the machinery and eventually did save um, 
one of his crew's life. But, you know, he got no recognition, went back home to Philly, worked at the post office, didn't even graduate, finally got his, his high school diploma when he was like 80 and it was like an honorary one. His kids all went to college and he just led this really sweet life. And there was something about that story that really touched me. And I think for the first time in my life, I felt like I was American. And I was American because of people like George who gave so much to this country so that I could be where I am today. And my father also served in the Navy during World War II, but when he would tell me stories, I would kind of like, yeah, you're crazy. Like, why would you do that, you know? I mean, I listened, but I didn't listen. And so it just hit me that day at work that there was something there, that there was something to the stories of all these African-American men and women who are literally invisible in the conversation of um, veterans or attaching their service, especially World War II vets to the civil rights movement because that's the era, that's the age. Um, and so that's where We Were There came from. And so what I'm gonna do is happily and excitedly introduce you to some of the vets that I met who changed my life. Many of the World War II vets and even the Korean vet that I'm gonna be reading, they've passed away, which just sort of tells me like how important it is if you have someone in your family who has served to listen to them and record their stories. Because even if you think, oh, well, they didn't win the Medal of Honor or they weren't you know, the general who did this really amazing thing, the reality is that all of them are amazing. And that's something else I learned was in little stories, there's so much magic and so much truth and so much honor and dignity. And every story deserves to be told. So let me get into my little screen share. Um, and start off with um, I guess everyone can see this. Um, I'm not sure how to do a full screen, so we'll just, uh, here we do a full screen. I guess this is the best you can do with a Google Slides. I usually do PowerPoint, but we'll make it work. We'll make it work. Right, this is, uh, this is Gertrude. Her name is Marguerite Gertrude Ivory Bertram, and she was a nurse during World War II. And so you have to think that back then, the beginning of the war, they didn't even want um, Black women to serve as nurses because nobody, they didn't want them touching white soldiers. But the war got so out of control that eventually they started to have to let in Black nurses, and Gertrude was one of the nurses that they that that um, signed up and was. Um, was accepted in. And so she told me this story about when she was in um, training, which was segregated, but um, at the same time, some of the obstacles and things that they had to do, it was integrated. Um, so she says, I'll never forget this one time at Fort Bragg when I was struggling up a steep hill in a night drill. I was sweaty and my legs could barely move over the rocks. I was stooping lower and lower under the weight of my backpack. Finally, I just gave out. Two white nurses saw me and ran over and helped me. Each one took an arm and they practically carried me to the top of the hill. When they got me to the top, the moonlight shined on my face and they saw my color. They roughly turned me loose and I almost fell back down that hill. I steadied myself and didn't say anything to them. I kept my temper and felt sorry for them. Back then, if a white person was seen as being nice to us, they would get criticized and ignored by their own people. In that way, white people suffered too. They didn't wanna make enemies among their friends. And here is what Gertrude looked like when I interviewed her. Um, it's her with her granddaughter. And she's also, she passed away about six years ago at the age of like 95 or something. 
And she also went on to a, a really great nursing career and did a lot of work with AIDS patients, actually. And this is James Tillman. And James Tillman was a um, Buffalo soldier, which was a name that they gave a, the 92nd Infantry, which was the only Black infantry unit to fight in World War II. I mean, again, the military was segregated and a lot of people thought, oh, well, black men can't fight. There's something wrong with them. They are not smart enough. But as the war progressed, desperation set in and black men were sent out to fight. <laughs> That's my dog. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> um, um, so he fought all up and down. Italy went through it all. It was pretty intense. Um, and then the war was over. He found out when they were in Italy, put them on a boat, sent them back to the United States. And this is what happened to him when he got home. They sent us back to the States and we landed in Norfolk, Virginia. We were all Buffalo soldiers and they didn't want us to go through the town. They said it would cause too much traffic, but I knew it was because we were black and that hurt. We waited there on the docks for two hours with no facilities. And finally, our officer said we could walk the five miles to the camp. As we walked, people were giving us strange looks as if we were convicts. We were the first troops home, but no one clapped or cheered. The whole town was white. And had we been white, they would have mobbed us. They would have been so happy, but things were so segregated. They thought that was how they were supposed to act. Later on, I saw how people celebrated elsewhere, but not in Virginia, not for us. The few black people we saw looked scared. Maybe they thought they would get lynched or something if they cheered for us. But I was a dedicated man. I was a sergeant and I had 100 men in my charge. I told them we're not gonna walk through town like convicts with our heads down. I said, we're gonna march with our head up and shout out in cadence. We had orders that night not to go into town. Our commander knew if we went there, we would be in trouble. They wanted, to, we wanted, they wanted to get us out of there. The next day they fixed it so we could go home wherever that might be. After that, we all just scattered. No one ever had any kind of celebration that included us as far as I know, even though we accomplished what all the black leaders wanted us to. When I came home, I couldn't even get a job. But while in the army, I vowed that if I lived, I would go back to my father's church, change my ways and be thankful. That was the main thing in my mind. I had a purpose. I was gonna come back and serve the Lord. I wanted to do my share and that's what I did. Now, when I think about the war, it seems like a dream. And this is James. Um, the photos from this book are taken by Ron Tarver, who's a photojournalist as well as a documentarian and an artist. And I think his photos are just beautiful and capturing. Um, the cool thing about James is when the World War II Memorial was built, was dedicated, because we were there was out, the Smithsonian had an event um, and they invited some of my World War II vets. And when I told the story of what happened to James, so this is a Smithsonian, you know, huge, it's small, it's small, the museum, you know, amazing, big, the place was packed, I couldn't believe it. Every single person in the audience stood up and clapped for James and he broke down and cried. He just started weeping on the stage and everyone was just screaming and cheering for him. And that was the first time anyone's ever said, you know, thank you. You did something really awesome. And this is Robert Yancey, who is pretty, who was a pretty incredible guy. He served in three wars, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And this is a shot from him um, in Vietnam. But I'm gonna read a little section from Korea, which again, part of the Buffalo Soldiers, which is what they call the, the um, the soldiers who are in all black units. This was the end in Korea of segregation. They started at this point after to start integrating the troops. Um, so he tells us a little bit about what it was like there. When you're on the front line, the object is to stay alive, know where you are at and know the location of the enemy. 
The problems start when they infiltrate the line, when they break the line and get behind you and you are, and you are shooting all around, it's crazy. The more you're on the front line, the more you learn to control your fears. Most people get killed because they were fearful. They couldn't control their fears and did dumb things. You'd say, stay down, and they wanna look. And so they get hit right through the head. Many times after skirmishes, you see the trucks loading the bodies in, go into the graveyard and you ask yourself, when is it gonna be my turn? That's the part that was hard, but you learn not to question the man upstairs. You understand me? You don't question him. We'd go out and lay minefields, plus set up perimeters. And I tell the guys, I'm the recorder. I record the minefields. You don't ever, ever go back in a minefield for nothing. One time we were there taking inventory and so forth. And when we came out, I said, where is Kincaid? And then I heard a big explosion. They said he walked back in to get his field jacket. And I said, you see what happens when you don't follow instructions? I would have got him another field jacket. He lost his life. He weighed about 145, 150 pounds and they only found about 10 pounds of him. He stepped on a mine. When things like that happen, when part of your crew, part of your squad gets killed, everyone gets shook. When you're in the military, you don't have your family with you. So you take to the people you are surrounded with. You give your life for them and they give their life for you. And that's Robert Yancey. And this is Marie Rogers. She was a, a nurse um, during the Vietnam War. She actually worked in the operating room and was in a field hospital and saw all kinds of action, you know, won a whole bunch of awards. Um, she's a pretty incredible woman. And here's a story um, she told me. A young soldier came in with a head injury and, when we, and we were really busy. We put him flat on the table and draped his head. His legs were injured too. He was a tall blonde fellow, could have been a football player. He was awake and I kept saying, soldier? And then told him what I was gonna to do to him. He'd say, yes, ma'am. I shaved his head and I talked to him the whole time. I told him he was gonna be all right and we'd take care of him. He kept saying, yes, ma'am. He died on the table. We were short staffed so my, my sergeant and I had to take care of his body. We took him off the table and to an area in the back where we kept the bodies. I had to put him in a body bag. He's the only one I ever did that to. I had to put three tags on him, one tag on his toe, one tag around his wrist, and another on the outside of the bag. It was hard to get him in the bag. We started at the feet. It was like putting a snowsuit on a small child. So we did this. Things were going through my mind, but I couldn't start moaning and groaning and all that foolish stuff. This is a young man who is dead and you have to do things right. But I kept thinking his mama doesn't even know he's dead. Somewhere in the States, this boy's mama is doing something, going to work, cooking dinner, cleaning the house, and her boy is dead and she won't know until tomorrow. And this is Don Radner. He was a prisoner of war. One of the things in Vietnam, one of the things I tried to do in the book was to find um, African-Americans who we're doing things that kind of threaded through some of the big moments where usually white soldiers are the characters that we see. So in the book, there's someone who was in Iwo Jima, there was someone, you know, who was a D-Day, there's, you know, nurses, um, black nurses and, um, you know, Pearl Harbor, there's, and then there's Don who was a, a prisoner of war in Vietnam for seven years. And he says, 
I prayed all day. I dreamed of family, home, birthdays, Christmas, and things I wanted to do for my family and things I hadn't done for my family. I wondered if my mother and father would be alive when I got back. I wondered what they'd be thinking. I was praying, begging them to hold on, begging myself to hold on. I know one guy who died. There was nothing physically wrong with him. He just lay up in the bed and died. He gave up. He put the blanket over his head and died. I kept track of dates with little notches on the wall. It was important for me to remember my daughter's birthday, my wife's birthday, my mother's birthday, the date we got married, Christmas and New Year's. I think, gee, if I were home, what, I, what would I do for that day? What did we do last year or the years before? Remember that time? It was important. It was a survival mechanism. I would be like, today's my mom's birthday. If I was home, I would take her to such and such restaurant because I know that's where she would like to go. What would I have bought her? Gee, she likes scarves. So I would picture a designer scarf or something and that would take the whole day to think about all that. Then I think about what I did last year on her birthday and try to remember a funny incident the year before that. I also had a ritual when emptying my pot. When I emptied my pot the first time, that's when I made my mark on the wall. That was always the ritual, come back, make the mark. It was important to keep track of days and it was kind of easy. During the week, the radio on the camp would come on with exercises. On Sunday, they would have a children's choir on the radio. So you always knew when Sunday was. Maybe I'd say a few extra prayers that day because I was supposed to be at church. Sometimes since I was an altar boy, I would go through the whole mass in Latin in my head. And so Don was this really like sort of tough guy, like, you know, smoking and like very matter of fact um, about everything. And then we sort of got to this point in the interview when we talked about when he came home. The next um, joyful moment is one of the, okay. Pedro's, okay. The next joyful moment was when they told us we were dry coming over California. They took us to a military hospital and that's where I met the family. I met Andrea Carsi and then made a few remarks to the press. I then saw my mother, Paige, my daughter, and Lisa, my stepdaughter. Paige was about 19 months when I left. When I came back in 73, she was seven years and one month. Later on that evening, my mother and Paige were next door in an attached room. Andrea and I were sitting in our room with a family assistance officer and we were all talking. She had put Paige to bed. We were sitting there talking and Paige came in the room. She wanted to read me a story. Nobody listens to Andrew. She crawled into my lap with the book. In 1967, when I went to Vietnam, she was just learning how to say, I love you, daddy. She would give her mother fits because we would send each other tapes back and forth. And Paige would want to stay up late talking on the tape, or tape recorder, she would say. Talking daddy, talking daddy, mom, I love you daddy, I love you daddy. That was all Paige could say. When I came back home that night, Paige is in her night clothes with her book on my lap. I was a prisoner for five and a half years and I never cried. I hurt, I hurt like hell, but I never cried. That night, I cried. And when he told me that story, he cried. And that really, um, it really kind of really. And then when I went in my car, I cried too. And I think that's the only person in the whole book I actually cried. Um, I kind of cried with because I was just so sad. And he actually called his daughter on the phone while I was there, while he was crying. And I'm actually still in touch with his daughter. He passed away about 10 years ago. All right, and this is uh, Jamel Daniels. Um, and uh, this is now from In Conflict. And um, I really wanted to get, um, you know, an amputee in the book. And when I did In Conflict, I wanted it to look more like America. So it, it's very diverse. And Jamel and me have really similar background. He is half um, Jamaican and half Puerto Rican and I'm half Dominican and half Jamaican. So we spoke a few times on the phone before I went to Walter Reed to interview him and I just loved him. I felt like I was talking to like my cousin or something like we just, he's from New York, I'm from New York. I mean, it was Manhattan, the whole like, 
same kind of way we spoke. I just like totally felt such a strong connection to him. And so, but when I got to Walter Reed, it was really hard. I got lost and um, I saw things there, like just by being lost, it just like, I can still remember it to this day. It's just really, really hard to see so many young people missing limbs, blind, clearly um, their brains are not working right. Um, so I got lost and then I finally found Jamal and, and he's in a wheelchair, he's a missing leg. The other leg, the pins are everywhere. And so um, this is, um, I'll read to you a little bit of what he told me. Um, now I get mad because I wanna be home with my wife and kid and I can't do it. I can't even get in my apartment. It's kind of embarrassing, you know? I go to the lobby, there's two elevators, but I have to have my wheelchair lifted up the three steps into the building and my wife can't do it. She's not that strong. So one of the guys comes down and helps me up the stairs. Then I get into the elevator. And when I get to the door, it's so narrow. And as soon as you get in, you have to go through a narrow hallway. In order for me to get into the bedroom, it's kind of embarrassing. I have to get on the floor and crawl to the bed. I don't like my son to see me like that. My son has a skateboard and one time I tried that. I put my body on the board and dragged my arms across the floor to the bedroom. It's embarrassing that I have to go through that, you know? I wanna spend time with them. For me to spend time, spend the night, for me to go to the bathroom, I can't get up. So when I go to New York, I stay in the Double Tree Hotel. This sucks. I'm tired of sitting. I'm a very active person. Most of the guys here are 18, 19, and 20. I'm 26. I'm the old guy here. Most of us are missing limbs. It hurts them every day like it hurts me. When I get out of here, it will be rough. I'm gonna have a prosthetic leg. My ankle is fused and my only leg will have no bend in it for the rest of my life but you can't dwell on it. I used to be very angry, but you just can't sit there feeling sorry for yourself. You have guys here who are worse than me, missing two legs, two arms and an eye. I have been here at Walter Reed for a long time. The accident happened eight months ago and I have a long way to go. I don't know when I'll get out of here. I had a lot of rehab ahead of me, but I'm trying to stay positive. I know things will get better. I'm trying not to dwell on the negative. Sometimes when I'm asleep, I dream. I see myself walking, running, and everything is all right again. I'm so happy. Then I wake up and I'm back to the reality of this. And I guess we have time for one more. <laughs> This is um, Harold Noel. And one of the things I wanted to do in the book was I wanted to interview a homeless vet. And um, so I went around searching, 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 and I found Harold. And I have to say it was probably one of the scariest interviews I've ever done because he clearly had PTSD. A lot of the um, Iraq war vets, when I interviewed them had guns in the house. Um, a lot of times I'd say, can you take the gun into another room and close the door? Because I figured if they, if they kind of lost it, if it was in another room, I and I would always make sure I knew where the door was, but it was, it was really scary. Um, they were all such great people, like so wonderful and sweet to me, but you could see the rage. And I think with Harold, I saw the rage the most. Um, you know, he was in the reserves, he joined to get a job. Um, and, you know, so here's a story he told me that really just killed me. One day we were driving, um, one of the tanks flipped over in a ditch. So we all had to stop, pull guard duty and secure the area. The fueler stayed in the middle and I'm a fueler. So everything is secure and daylight hits. There was this sandstorm the night before and it was pitch black at night. So we had to wait until the, sand, the sandstorm dried, died down. So when the sun comes up and everything clears, the first thing we see is a crowd of people who are standing there waiting. We get paranoid and we tell them to back up. 
Meanwhile, a bigger tank comes and pulls the tank out of the ditch. Suddenly, as we are about to pull off, this lady appears out of nowhere and starts walking towards us. She has something wrapped up in her arms and she's walking real slow toward my truck. I don't know how she got past the soldiers. They're all telling her to stop. I have my M16 and I'm like saying in Iraqi, whatever to stop, but she doesn't, she keeps walking. No one knows if she's carrying a bomb or what. So shots were fired and the lady falls. Whatever was in her hand falls and rolls. Then you see the hand of a baby come up from the wrap and it's crying. Everyone was like, wow. The lady got shot in the head by mistake. It wasn't meant for that. We tried to shoot her in the leg, but soldiers are paranoid. They didn't want to get close to her. I did it. I shot her. It wasn't my fault. I didn't mean for it to hit her in the head. Then the baby was lying there. I was stunned. I was like, damn, I don't know what to do. I was frozen. The baby was crying. It was moving its hands. When I took the first step to pick up the baby, another convoy came zooming by and ran over the baby. The baby was all tangled up and started rolling. Its head came off, the body rolled in one direction, the head in another. The baby's body was all tangled up and just rolling and then truck after truck after truck rolled over it. It was sick and it haunts me every day. I can't make it stop. And then he ended by telling me, I'm gonna turn 26 soon and I'm gonna sit here and get drunk. I'm scared to go out. I'm scared to take a train. I can't be around too many people. I was never one to complain about this country, but damn, don't you think if you put your life on the line for this country, you deserve something? I hear things in my head all the time, like kids crying, bombs going off, shit like that. I left one war to go to another. I left the physical war and now I'm in a mental one. And that's the stories. Well, thank you for uh, sharing. If anyone, um, I see Professor Soltis already has a question. Um, I'll go ahead and unmute. <clears throat> Uh, Yvonne, thank you so much for these powerful stories. That that is, was very moving, especially that last one. I know it was very graphic, but very necessary to hear those details. What what's going through your mind as the receiver of this information, and they're putting kind of their heart out there? How do you kind of be journalist and human kind of at the same time? I mean, I have to say that I did these books pretty much back to back, and it was really hard for me. Um, you know, for pretty much the majority of the black vets of we were there, I was the first person that they had told these stories. I had Vietnam vets pull off their shirts and show me sharp no wounds and um, things got very emotional and very um, dramatic. And, you know, I also interviewed um, Tammy Duckworth, who's a Senator now back when she was in Walter Reed um, and she, kind of tricked me and left me in Walter Reed rehab for about two hours waiting for her. And that like completely traumatized me, the kinds of things I saw there. It was really hard. Um, I mean, I'm so, feel so blessed that I was able to do this and so grateful for their trust. But um, the situations were very, very emotional. And you do become like a vessel for people's pain in a way when you do work like this. And you just have to pray that you have the strength to, to not only receive it, but then do justice to it. And you know, then after in conflict became the play. And then that was another like maybe two years of continuing um, to be heavily engaged in the stories. But, um, it was very, very intense. And, um, you know, like I said, Harold probably scared me the most because I felt like he just was in such a bad, bad place. You know, it was, it was, it was in real time. Like a lot of in conflict, Fallujah had just happened. And one of my vets, I believe, committed suicide from in conflict. The Republican who was really proud of his service suddenly was dead, Sam. 
Um, We did have a, a question about the um, last photo for the last story, the baby mm -hmm. in his arms. Was that his baby? Yes. I, I'm, I'm also curious. So you, you, um, that last story, again, he talked about that physical journey that he was on and, and the, 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 the physical anguish and then the mental anguish later on as well, too. Um, do you feel like that's still, from a journalism perspective, a story that's too often untold? Um, we often hear about PTSD, but we really don't follow through after combat action is, is kind of uh, ceased. I mean, I think there's been a lot more reporting on the Iraq war and the effects it's had on the veterans, but it's almost like an ongoing story. Um, and I think it gets pushed, like especially in the news cycle of the last four years, you know, it's very Trump dominated. And a lot of these type of issues that are going on with veterans get pushed to the side. And it's unfortunate because, you know, when you, especially now it's a volunteer army, you know, when you volunteer to put your life on the line like this, your story should not just end because of like, you know, some sort of a circus political atmosphere. And it, it is, you know, I don't think that there, I agree. I don't think there's enough attention paid to like what's happening with these guys now and these women, like, how are they doing? What's the load at, you know, even with COVID, like how are vets doing with this? Especially if you think about the operation Iraqi freedom, the Gulf war, um, where they were exposed to so many toxic chemicals. Like how are those vets faring with COVID would be a really great story to do, but it's just lost in them. We do have um, Dr. Siegelman has a question. Hold on, I hit ask to unmute. Let's see if this works. You should be able to unmute yourself now. Okay. Well, yeah. Ron, um, you know, I had some, I had a question, but after that last story, I like, <laughs> you know, I was uh, knocked out a bit. Um, my, my brother was in the Navy during the war in, in Vietnam, and he was a physical therapist stationed in Bremerton, Washington. Mm -hmm. And for two years, he treated the, the people and men and women who came back from Vietnam. And after those two years, he never practiced physical therapy again because he told me that what he saw and what he went through, he did with all the strength in his body and his mind and his heart, and he couldn't bear to practice anymore. So he taught physical therapy. He didn't leave the profession. Yeah. Now, you, uh, um, it's about, the question is more about you. I was very interested at your story about George and how all of a sudden, for the first time, you felt that you were American. Mm -hmm. And then I'm listening and I found out you were a Puerto Rican Jamaican. And, Dominican. Uh, I'm Dominican Jamaican. Jamel Dominican. Puerto Puerto yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. My parents. It was somebody parents, else was, I, I was born friend in, was Puerto Rican. I was born on the borders of Harlem. So okay. I was born there. <laughs> So but you were you were you brought up in the culture of a, a Caribbean culture? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you were some some you were like Caribbean American, but you were feeling more Caribbean. And could you could you tell I us? Was, the thing is, I wasn't even feeling Caribbean. You feel sort of like nothing. Well, I'm the hyphen. <laughs> you feel a little bit like the hyphen. Either you way, you just exist. You just exist. You're could sort you of like, a hyphen that, American. Could you more tell about, us more about that moment when you all of a sudden felt American? And also, did did you feel more Caribbean when you felt American? Did you feel both, or just lose Caribbean altogether? And <laughs> I mean, I'm always um, a daughter of a Dominican immigrant, so right. that's, I also have a piece on NPR about that if you want to hear about okay. my mom. <laughs> um, so you're um, on the hyphen. The USA. Um, yeah. No, so um, it's not about losing anything. I mean, I have all these identities, but it's about the reality, the truth of the matter is I have an American passport. I was born in New York City. I'm American, mm -hmm. but I feel like the way America is. I mean, America is racist. And I think that it's really hard, especially if you grow up in America, not to feel that at some point in your life. And when you feel like 
you know, make America great for some people, but not for you or glorifying times that, you know, of Jim Crow or those were the days really makes you feel like you're not part of the American dream, sure. so to speak. And that's, I think, what I meant. Like, I think when you grow up and you know all the struggles of Black people, sometimes it's really hard to connect to this bigger idea of being American. But there is strength in doing that when there's national tragedy like 9-11. And I just didn't have yes. that resource. Does that make sense? Yeah. But I feel like yes. right now I'm always proud of like where my parents are from and I rep hard DR and all that. But yeah, um, absolutely. The truth and, of the matter is, I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a girl from I'm, the inner I'm, city, you know what I'm saying? I don't think there's any loss. I think you when you feel both where yeah. you where you came from, where your parents came from, mm -hmm. and what you are now, mm -hmm. there's never any loss. It's always a gain as right. long as you could feel comfortable on on either either side. Yeah, I don't think mm -hmm. I felt comfortable much on the American side. No, until very, a point. I felt too. very hyphenated. I was a very right. you're this and that, and you're this and that. Um, yeah. Even though, you know, this is where I'm from. You know, mm -hmm. I'm a product of this country, good right. and bad. You know. We do yes. have a question. We do have another question from the chat box. Um, Casey Scott is, a, is asking, excuse me, were you alone for every interview or did you have people there so it wasn't just you? It was just me. It was me alone. I was alone, which is why mostly within conflict, sometimes it felt scary when I saw like the guns, you know, <laughs> I was like, well, okay, I hope everybody's okay. Um, but yeah, it was just me. I mean, you have to do it by yourself because you want to create like co contact. You don't want any distractions. Even with, um, we were there, the photographer went at a different time and created his own experience with them. So it didn't distract from my time with them. And then we have another question um, from the chat box. Did any of the vets express remorse for their service or question the validity of the American involvement in the wars involved, in the wars themselves, excuse me? I would say there was definitely a little kickback on Vietnam. I would say there was a lot on the Iraq war. I mean, I went to Canada to interview someone who, <laughs> who literally fled from his unit. Um, there were two in the book who, kind of didn't, you know, kind of ran off, so to speak. Some of them became anti-war activists. Um, and even, you know, like John Soltz, who is now, I think he's a colonel or something. Um, he had regret about the war as well. I mean, sometimes the people that served in the Iraq war are the best spokesmen for why it's a valid war or not. I had a question too. You talked um, in the book, uh, it opens up with a story about Leonard Smith. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he went, um, and he, I was just wondering if you could talk about the experience for some of the veterans of not having their stories believed. And I can tell, I mean, I, it's better if you tell how he wasn't believed um, in something major, I consider very major that he took part in. I mean, that's race. That was the time. That was the time. I mean, it was such a racist time in the 1940s and no one, I mean, there was still like the woman that I had who worked in the post office, Gladys, like, you know, she, when she went to Europe, they actually believed that black people had tails and were shocked to see how beautiful these black women were. And they would parade, you know, do like these parades, they get all dressed up and parade up and down. And the, the people are like, oh my God, these black women are so attractive and so classy because the, the idea was that black people had tails, black American women, black Americans had tails. And so Leonard saw a lot of action with the 761st. It was a very, you know, legendary unit and did a lot of amazing things. I mean, he, he freed, a, you know, as part of a freeing a concentration camp. And those are the kinds of things you don't want to associate with black people. Anything that involved heroics during World War II, they wanted a, a white face. So even though they were African-Americans who served in Iwo Jima and in D-Day, in Battle of the Bulge, and all of these amazing victories, that's not the story that America wanted to promote. So of course they didn't believe him because, you know, black people could never ever do what he did. And that haunted him. 
But I do think it's so beautiful that he became friends with the per person that he freed from a concentration camp. I always thought that was the most beautiful part of the story and how they would do talks together in libraries. And I mean, and I think that's the thing with a lot of the World War II people for me is how they overcame such incredible adversity, you know? And Professor Soltis does have another question. You, you talked in the introduction that you have veterans as well in your family. And I'm wondering if by going deeper with the interviews that you've done, if it's helped you understand and contextualize your own family's service as well. Well, it's really only my father who dropped out of high school to serve in World War II. Um, I wish I would have talked to him more about his experiences rather than kind of blowing him off. I think I understand him better. I think I understand him a lot better, but by the time the book came out, he had died. So, I mean, I dedicated the book to him because I think he would have gotten such a kick out of the fact that I wrote it. Um, I mean, I have a lot of respect for veterans. I mean, I just really do, you know, it's like, I learned so much. I think I was having daddy issues and with a lot of the World War II vets and the Korea vets. Um, but yeah, I, I would say that it has, it, it's helped me a lot to understand him and understand the time he lived in. A lot of journalism with veter involving veterans and also oral histories, there's kind of that background of um, preservation because the voices will be lost one day. Did, was, mm -hmm. was that, were you very aware of that too, that you were you were possibly going to be their at least written legacy for a lot of these people who might never have been in a book, let's say, or a journalism article? Yeah, I totally knew that, which is why I wanted to include vets who were at, you know, sort of big events, but also just vets who could kind of connect dots of how certain things were, um, who could represent, like to me, each one of the vets, you know, represent thousands of other people. So yeah, I definitely knew that. And you know, with We Were There, it was so beautiful that like we had the event at the Smithsonian and there was so much around it. You know, there was an exhibit at the Constitution Center. Um, it was so much in celebration of them. And then within conflict, the play was pretty, pretty amazing. Well, why, uh, just one more, I'm, I hate to hog here, but what, what, <laughs> why, why was the play met with such controversy? Oh, that was the Wilton High School version, um, their version of the play, because the vets were like, I don't know, it was a conservative school because the principals, a parent complained that they didn't want their kid to be exposed to this kind of stuff. And so it became this controversy where the principal um, decided they weren't going to do the play. And then there was a whole lot of kickback and the kickback just made the whole thing blow up. I mean, they even, the, 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 the public theater version was even like broadcasted to veterans in Iraq. Like it was kind of like, it got, it just like got really, really big, mostly because it would, they tried to stop it. Hmm. A lot of people still wanted to believe that Iraq was like this really great thing. Hmm. And to believe that there was so much trouble with it and so much suffering goes against the, the narrative. People just want to wear, you know, the yellow ribbon. We respect our troops. So they don't really want to hear what they have to say. They don't want to hear the truth. The truth is a dirty word I realized in American culture. People run from the truth and journalism is all about the truth, so. How about patriotism? That's another kind of word that can be debated about for sure. Um, how, how would you define patriotism in your mind? Wow, that's a hard question. I think someone who's patriotic is someone who loves their country and respects their country and um, will do what is necessary to be done to help their country when needed. I think that's what it means to me. I think people confuse it confused with patriotism is. It's not in othering people. It's not about putting people down. It's not about preventing others from having freedom. It's about personal, like you personally, what can you do to help? And I think being patriotic is actually, like I think writing these books was a patriotic act. I think, you know, I think being just a good person, being a good American citizen is a patriotic act. Being a caring and loving and kind person 
towards other Americans and others in general is a patriotic act. Thank you so much. Do we have any other questions? Always that awkward moment in Zoom when we're waiting to see. <laughs> I just want, I just wanted to make sure. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, please everyone thank Yvonne Laddie. I think we can all agree that this was a very powerful event um, for the stories that you shared for um, the, you know, I wanna thank you, especially for bringing up issues related to PTSD and other relevant issues. So just thank you very much for, for sharing these stories. It was great. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Everybody stay safe. Stay safe. Take care of yourself. Thank you. All right.